Step one for intimacy anorexia. That is our topic today. Now, intimacy anorexia is a huge issue. It is where you actively withhold spiritual, emotional, and sexual intimacy from your spouse, and they feel so married and alone. Step one is the beginning of healing for intimacy anorexia. So stay tuned and watch this. Now, if you have not subscribed to our channel, please do. We have literally hundreds of videos to help you in your journey to recovery. And if you have a question, you got to put it in the box and I'll be happy to answer it. So stay tuned. Step one for intimacy anorexia. Now, intimacy anorexia is the active withholding of spiritual, emotional, and sexual intimacy from your spouse. Everyone else thinks you're a wonderful person, but when they come home, their heart's close to their spouse. Now, if you're watching this, you already know you're an intimacy anorexic. I don't need to sell you on that. Your spouse's pain has been real. He or she has cried out to you for years to be loved, to be connected to. You've, you are aware now that you actually do do this and you do it intentionally and that you withhold, you, you want to be safe, you pull away, you push away. But how do you get out of this addictive cycle of doing that? Well, that's what step one is all about. It's about starting the journey to not do that anymore, to be free from withholding. So in step one, we're going to walk through what that is and so that you can move away from withholding into opening, into giving. Now, if you don't have the Intimacy Anorexia Workbook and the Intimacy Anorexia Step Workbook, I strongly recommend you get those because it's going to be pages and pages of helping you do Step 1 through 12. It's pages and pages of exercises that have been proven to help you move away from the Intimacy Anorexia. You become really sober and free and well and giving and connecting to your spouse, to give your heart to your spouse. So in this short video, we're going to just go through the key thoughts on step one for intimacy and anorexia. The first word is we. We. Trust me, since this paradigm of intimacy and anorexia we created well over a decade ago, we have gotten thousands of emails from all over the world. Dr. Weiss, this is what I'm living with. Dr. Weiss, this is my marriage. Dr. Weiss, this is my husband. This is my wife. This explains my, my pain. This explains what I've been doing to my spouse. Thousands of these in every culture, every color, every religion. It's a real thing. A person's addicted to withholding. And it, and it causes pain for the spouse, but it causes pain for the anorexic. They don't want to be this soul. They don't want to be withholding. They, they want to be loving and giving. They want to be that good image that they have in their mind, but that they're really not in their behavior. We means you're not alone, okay? There are many, many people in their support groups uh, around the country for intimacy and anorexia. It's a real deal. You have a real issue, but you don't have to be alone, and you can't make it successfully in recovery by yourself. So when you admit, when you admit that uh, you have an issue, you're beginning the process, you're you're saying, I'm part of this particular tribe, okay? Admitted, that's a tough one. That's a very tough one. Because intimacy and anorexia is actually set up almost opposed to being able to admit. Because oftentimes the intimacy and anorexic is an object relationship. There is the good Joe or Jane, either way. And they are truly wonderful. They're good people. They might go to church. They're great neighbors. They cut your lawn. You know, they're good parents. You know, they pay the bills or taxes. And on the outside, everything looks good. And they like this good box of them. And then there's this Darth Vader spot. There's this, there's this place where they pull away and they're, they're unkind and, they're, and, they, and they sit alone. They're on their phone. They're on Facebook. They're doing stuff, you know, for hours, avoiding their spouse. They're in the garage. They're cleaning. They're volunteering. And the, the marriage is deteriorating. Uh, they don't touch their spouse. They don't initiate. They don't uh, hug and kiss and fondle and play and, 
they're not romantic with them and they kind of take them for granted to be honest and sometimes they're not having sex for days weeks or months or years or decades at a time and then and somehow they justify that's okay well it's not okay it's an act of cruelty all that is cruelty to the other person okay it feels abusive it feels neglectful i can't tell you with thousands of tears i have on my floor from men and women who've been unloved okay and being in the same house does not mean you love the person. Moving towards them means you love that person. Okay? I'm not just being faithful to them, faithful toward them. If you're not faithful towards them, they feel alone. Okay? And there are support groups called Married and Alone because they are married and alone. And so when you admit that I am anorexic, I actually do withhold. I actually do it intentionally. Now, the intentional piece, be patient with yourself. It might take you a couple months to actually get that you do it intentionally. The first step is just admitting that you're doing it. And eventually you'll be able to admit that you're doing it intentionally. It takes a while because you, because of the good box, bad box stuff, you know, you don't want to be bad. So who would do this to their spouse? Certainly not a good person, right? So it takes a while for you to connect that what you're doing has intentionality. What you're doing is selfish. What you're doing is addictive. Okay, that you actually use it to medicate your life. You actually use it in a way to avoid intimacy and connection with the one you said you would love, honor, and cherish. And with everyone else, you're good. You talk, you share, you open, you pray with them, you, you share your heart with them, your, your political views, your life, you know, but your spouse really doesn't get you, doesn't get your heart. And admitting that your intimacy in Mexico is one of the hardest things to do. I, I've worked with many types of addiction over my career. And for someone to admit that they are intentionally withholding love in various forms from their spouse, it's a hard thing. So if you are watching this, I want to first of all say congratulations out of the millions of men and women who struggle with this. God must like you because you're getting information to be able to heal. And that's beautiful. So don't be ashamed of where you've come from. Be proud of where you're going to. And it's, it can be a beautiful place. Now I've seen the miracle of recovery, step one's part of that, where men and women become lovers, they, they become engaged spiritually, mostly their sex life returns, and they live happily ever after. If I didn't see that miracle of recovery all the time, I'd find something else to do. But it is fun to watch, no matter how hard your heart is, that it can open up if you do the work. So your, your we means you're involving other people. You're gonna get into a phone group or a local group because you're gonna need someone specifically who understands anorexia. And if they don't, they're not gonna be able to help you. General counselors do not have enough information. Now we do have a training um, at aasat.org on intimacy and anorexia uh, for, for counselors. And some people just buy it for them to get all the information they can get, okay? That's fine, but it's gonna take more than information. You have to get an accountability with somebody. So you're admitting that you're powerless that you've tried everything to get out of your shell. You've tried everything to push out. You can't do it by yourself. You've cried. You've, you know, maybe you gave it a good shot for, you know, seven, 10 days, then you kind of slide back to that kind of protective nature that you have. And this repeats again and again. Every time your spouse says, I'm going to divorce you, you're a good, you're, you know, you're a good soul for a couple of weeks. And then it kind of vanishes again and you have that conversation again. Admitting that you're powerless and you can't do this means you're going to involve other people means you're going to make phone calls to other, other people of the same gender and say, here's what I'm working on in my anorexia. Here's what I'm doing. Today I was busy. I took responsibility for that. Today I blamed, some, blamed my spouse. I took responsibility for that. And you're moving forward in such a healthy way. So when, you, when you're we admitted, you got others in your life. If you do not have another person helping you, you have not admitted. Okay. The next word is powerless. Powerless means you have no power. You can't, 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 can't get out of this by yourself. Now just look back at your history. You've tried and failed hundreds of times. You can't do it. And if you just buy the workbooks and stay at home, try to do it by yourself, that's not going to do it. You'll get information, but you're not going to heal. You need other people of the same gender on the same journey. You're going to have to build a community. Is once you build a community, I know you're powerless. If someone says, I did my step one, Dr. Weiss. I said, really? Who's your accountability person? I don't have one. Who's your group? I don't have one. I mean, you haven't, haven't even done step, you haven't even done the first word, which is we, you haven't created a we. So how could you be powerless because you haven't created a we? 
Powerless means I have no power. It's like you're literally drowning. The waves are hitting you in the face and you, there's no way to touch the bottom of the sea. There's no way to get to the land. There's, there's no way that you're going to live another moment unless someone throws you a rope and you grab a hold of that rope and on the other end, that person helps, pulls you back to safety. That's when you're powerless. When you have others in your life helping you, when you can acknowledge to another person, hey, I was critical. I was angry towards my spouse for no reason. I just pushed him or her away. I withheld sex this week. I was cruel to them. Now we're getting some there. Now we're getting powerless. Now we have admitted. Now we have a we. And then our lives have become unmanageable. And it's just not your life that's unmanageable. Your spouse is in, probably in pain. They can become dysfunctional. They could, they could use things to try to medicate the pain you're intentionally keeping them in. Okay. And if they're in pain and then you show up and they scream and you, you show up for a little bit and you take your little pictures and show that you're a good boy or girl and then they have to be in pain again. You have a great DVD called Pain for Love. You should watch that because there's a cycle that you might be putting your spouse in. It's not just your life that's become unmanageable. Sometimes the whole family becomes unmanageable. And yes, you look good at work or in your spiritual community, your neighborhood, but at home, it, it doesn't feel right. It feels alone. It feels like we're functioning. It feels like we're roommates. I can't tell you how many thousands of men and women have told me I feel like a roommate. That usually means they're married to someone like you. In intimacy in Mexico, they feel alone. They feel hurt. I have a whole DVD on um, partner betrayal trauma, which shows that the statistically, the PTSD, the depression, all the symptoms that go with infidelity and sex addiction are identical with someone who neglects their spouse. Uh, on uh, intimacy anorexic, identical. So the trauma that you're putting your spouse through is huge. That by itself will make your life unmanageable because they are now different because of your lack of love. And when you can admit that you're powerless and you can admit, I need help, and you actually reach out, get in a group, start making phone calls, you start changing your trajectory. You could become that loving person. You could actually become romantic. You could actually become thoughtful and considerate and buy them gifts on their birthday and Christmas and, and, and think about them and, and not be afraid of them, and not be afraid of being hurt because we're all going to get hurt. And when you take this journey on intimacy and anorexia, it's a tough one. Of all the addictions I've worked with, alcohol, drugs, sex, porn, uh, various eating disorders over my career, intimacy and anorexia is by far the hardest one. You know, with the food anorexic, they starve themselves. With the intimacy anorexic, they're starving the other person. So the intimacy anorexic is not feeling the pain of the starvation. Okay? So you're going to have to be motivated yourself to heal, to want to love, to come out of your shell, to open your heart, to be a lover to your spouse, to actually keep your wedding vows, to love, honor, and cherish, to move towards them and to get rid of all these strategies and games that you play to keep them at bay and to make them look like they're the problem or that they're the crazy one. Owning your own stuff, owning your own side of the street is part of step one, okay? We admit it, you're not alone, that you're powerless. You don't have any ability to do this by yourself. And that the intimacy and anorexia has an impact on you and those that you love. When you get this, you've done step one. If you are not part of our channel, I want you to subscribe to our channel, click the button below, and if you have a question, I want you to put it in the box so that we can answer it as soon as possible. So please do that.